Earlier this week, the United Nations warned that roughly one million of the world's species are on the verge of extinction, more than at any other time in human history. As William Brangham reports, one of those threatened species is one of the most iconic animals on Earth, the tiger. That's right, Judy. It's estimated there are fewer than 4,000 tigers remaining in the wild today, down from roughly 100,000 in the early 1900s. More tigers now live in captivity than in the wild. And many of those can be found in so-called tiger farms, where they are bred, raised, and then slaughtered, sold for their skin and body parts on the black market. In a new investigative report for The Washington Post, Terence McCoy traveled to Laos in Southeast Asia and got an inside look at some of these farms and the grisly trade that keeps them afloat. And Terence joins me now. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's really an uh, incredibly brutal and powerful piece of reporting that you've done about this market and the forces that are driving it. But can you just start off by telling us what is driving this market? What do people want Tiger Parts for? I mean, that's a big question that we had when we first started off with this was, what on earth do people want tigers for? Um, one of the most iconic of species. And what we found was some of the qualities that make the tiger so iconic have also been its undoing. That because it's so strong, because it's so ferocious, it has become something of a medicine for a lot of folks uh, in China for traditional Chinese medicine. That they think that all the elements that make the tiger what it is can also be used to treat human ailments. And the other factor of this is because it's become something of a status symbol, that, that if you are wealthy enough, you can actually wear tiger on you. It's a luxury item. So this has created a cir circumstance where people want it for both medicine and also just to show off their wealth. And just for the record, it's, there is no medicinal benefit to eating or imbibing no, anything from a tiger. There's no medicinal benefit to this whatsoever. Uh, uh, the, 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 there have been rumors that they have had medicinal elements going back 1,400 years, but clearly there's no medicinal benefit to that whatsoever. Your report is, is largely, is also a profile of this man, Carl Amman, who you basically travel with all through Southeast Asia. He is this sort of striking, quixotic uh, activist figure. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? As much as this story was a profile of the tiger trade and what's happening with the tiger is also a profile of obsession. And somebody becomes so consumed by their mission that it's, it, that it's all that they do. And Carl Mann has become something of a Don Cody figure in, in the conservation movement, just someone shouting into the wind. Uh, today, there are lots of discussion about the mounting extinction rates. Carl's been talking about this for decades. And for decades, not many people have been listening to him. And now, finally, he's doing more investigations that this is something that's happening in this world and it's something that we have to take note of. You visit several of these tiger farms in the course of your reporting. Some of them are sort of small and look very ramshackle. Others are almost industrial scale in their size. I mean, you must have been shocked to see this kind of, this sort of farming of an animal like a tiger. Yeah, the most amazing thing was that you'd be driving down these roads in Laos that were rural, and also you'd come upon some gates. And beyond those gates was something of a, an industrial enterprise that they could farm hundreds of tigers in these places. And then we'd have, we'd have a drone going over it, and inside that footage, you'd see tigers as small as ants down there prowling around, and you can see just at that moment that this isn't like a, a kitty operation. This is industrial, that, that, that we are creating out of this uh, tiger becomes a product along this assembly line. The thing that also really comes through in your reporting is this, the difficulty of trying to stamp out this trade. Because all the nations that you visit and all the big uh, Southeast Asian and Asian nations say, we want to put a stop to this trade, but it, it, it persists, as your reporting shows. Why is it so hard to stamp out? I mean, there's a difference between passing a law and actually enforcing it. And what's happening in a lot of countries where wildlife trafficking is especially rampant is there are the same places that also have endemic poverty have endemic struggles, and a lot of these countries have neither the legal framework nor sometimes even the political will to be able to take on very powerful entrenched wildlife interests in the country that, that want to traffic these animals. And also you have people who are just struggling to survive. And sometimes it's easy for you and I to say they shouldn't be doing this, but ultimately for them it's a decision between uh, poaching an animal or trafficking an animal or not being able to possibly to feed their family. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, what we have are people making those decisions to, to work in this enterprise. Carl Amon, who you follow, has actually been tracking this one particular tiger farmer for years. And there's an incredible scene where he actually meets him 
finally, after years of sort of hunting this man. Can you explain, describe that scene? It kind of typifies that same idea where, where he has been, um, he's been tracking this person for, for five years and he grows into this larger than life figure in Carl's mind where uh, he's talked to him in, in intimate detail about how he goes about butchering these tigers and finally Carl meets him. And what he finds is not some sort of gangster, some sort of taciturn, menacing person, but decked in jewelry. What he finds is somebody who is in dusty, dirty pants and flip-flops. Uh, it's just smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. Um, and what he finds is not is somebody who's impoverished. Um, and what Carl realizes in that moment is this just one more bit player in a world that's unable to save itself. Really a tremendous piece of reporting. Terrence McCoy of The Washington Post, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.